Hello, 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 guys. I am a few minutes late, but I do have a really fantastic and really good reasons for being late this morning. Uh, so I'm just going to sit here for a moment and just uh, catch my breath as I wait for you guys to jump on board. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know, those of you who are watching the replay, go ahead and put replay in the comment section. I do like to go back and just see what questions I may have missed, who was watching, and things like that. So if you're watching the replay right now, put replay into the comment section. And in the meantime, I'm just kind of waiting for a few people. I see some people popping on board. Love to know who you are, who's out there listening. So guys, I'm so excited. This is a week two of the Cozy Talk Strong Body program. Let's see who we got here. Hey, good morning, Megan. Hi, Glenda. Ladies, I'm so happy to see you this morning. So yes, week two of Cozy Talk Strong Body. So for those of you who are kind of joining me for the first time, my name is Cozy Bayo. So I'm a physical therapist and PT specialist here in Tampa, Florida. I recently launched a program called Cozy Talk Strong Body. Uh, it's an online exercise program with over 150 videos, 150 exercise videos for above the knee and below the knee amputees. And I'm going to go ahead and type that in. And I have, there we go. For those of you listening, there we go. There's the website right there. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Lori. Oh, good. I see so many people jumping on board. We got Virginia, Virginia from Virginia. Hey there, Mark. I know. Thank you for staying with me, Mark. Hey, Lori. Two weeks post-op today. Congratulations, Lori. Lori, today's show is going to help you out in your recovery process. So guys, as you can see, I'm by myself and I'm late. So let me just give you the quick and dirty explanation. I was at my kid's school at their science fair award ceremony. So I'm rushing home to get to, get to the show. And then my beautiful model, unfortunately, she had a situation that came up last minute. So she's not able to join us today. But I am going to be demonstrating these exercises. Hey, Alex from North Carolina. There's my fellow Tar Heel right there. Uh, Glenda says she shared the book with her therapist and she's getting the book. Oh, wonderful, Glenda. Thank you so much. And guys, those of you who have bought the books and subscription, thank you. Uh, whenever you buy something from a small business owner, we do a happy dance. Um, so guys, thank you so much. And those of you who are sharing these books and these resources with your therapist and your prosthetist, Thank you. There is a place um, in my website where clinicians can purchase subscriptions for their own patients as well. So that's something that I'm trying to get the word out about there. So any update about the above the knee book, Debbie, it's going to be end of year. I'm like, ah, trying to get that out as soon as possible. Um, but definitely Debbie, when it comes out, you're going to see it plastered all over my social media. Trust me, you're not going to miss it. And Debbie, if you're signed up for my email subscription, those are going to be the first people to find out when my above the knee book comes out. Um, okay, so let's get back to today, guys. So many of you are probably like, oh, how is she going to demonstrate exercises for us if she's not an amputee herself? So, and this actually came up in conversation a couple of days ago. I had a couple of people who are not amputees that they heard about my program and they wanted to know if they could purchase a subscription. They are they're runners. And I said, absolutely. So guys, the thing with exercises and physical therapists is we have a bank of general exercises that we prescribe to our patients. The difference is, is that when we're working with someone with a traumatic brain injury, we're going to adapt those exercises one way compared to someone with an amputation who's using a prosthesis or perhaps not yet using a prosthesis, we adapt the same exercise in different ways, okay? And these exercises in this program, this strong body program, Guys, I use them for my own training. I'm a runner, I'm a swimmer, I love playing tennis. I use, I pull from these exercises for my own fitness routine. And just to give you guys an example, right now, I'm on phase one for legs, phase two for core, okay? So you can combine the different body parts that way. So today, hey, Patricia, watching from Naples, all right. So guys, today we're gonna be talking about hip flexor tightness. Hip flexor tightness, that's probably along with glute strengthening, Hip flexors is probably what I get the most questions about from you all in terms of fitness and improvement, okay? So let's just do a quick anatomy lesson. Your hip flexors, okay, are located here at the front of your hip. And you got two big ones, right? You've got one that's called the iliopsoas muscle. It's actually two muscles, the, ili the ileus and the psoas muscle. 
and it's combined into one big beefy muscle and it's really deep inside in your pelvis, right? And it comes across here and it crosses over your hip. This is what allows your hip to flex, to come up forward. Now your quadriceps muscle also plays a role in this, but the big one is the iliopsoas. The thing with iliopsoas is it's a very big wide muscle, but it's short, okay? It's not a long muscle like your quadriceps. It's a short muscle. So what does that mean for you as an amputee? It means that it has a very high vulnerability for becoming tight. Why? Well, as we stand, as we move through our daily lives, right? Part of what keeps this muscle stretched out is the weight of your anatomical leg. So when you have an amputation, whether it's a below the knee or an above the knee, there's less weight there to hold that down and keep it stretched out. Okay, so there's going to be a tendency for tightness, sometimes leading up to contracture, meaning where the hip gets stuck in a flexed position. So Cosi pole, how many of you, when you went in for your prosthesis, were told by your prosthetist, you have tight hip flexors? How many of you? There may even been some of you that your prosthetist said that they couldn't fit you for a prosthesis because of how tight your hip flexors were. How many of you experienced that? Let's see. Virginia says, I have low vision. Does the book come in large print? Virginia, it's not large print per se. It's not the official large print for low vision. And I do apologize for that. I was only able to have the resources to do one printing of this book. Virginia, I will say this. I made the pictures as large and as colorful as possible. I wish I had the copy with me here. I'm a bad entrepreneur. I don't have my book with me. Um, but Virginia, the pictures are really nice and big. And then also on the videos, Virginia, and you can take a look on the main website. There's some sample videos there. So you can make the video large and obviously you hear me explaining the exercise. So you might want to just check and see if maybe the videos might be a better option for you. Rasheen, I'm so glad you could be here, man. It's good. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. We've got Trent in Colorado and it's snowing. <laughs> okay, so going back to the Yes, so Lori says, I've heard of that, and that's why I lay on my stomach for at least an hour to stretch. All right, guys, can you guys hear me? I was saying I was having a connection problem. Thumbs up in the comment section. So Stephen says, I had a contracture, and my physical therapist stretched out, and I no longer have it. So guys, there's two basic, okay, Patricia, you can hear me, but there's two basic ways when it comes to flexibility, guys. Two ways to stretch out tightness, two ways to stretch out a contracture. You can do static stretching or dynamic stretching. And much like the name indicates, static stretching means you're in a, in a stationary position. You're not moving and you're using gravity or a little bit of your body weight to do the stretching out, right? When you're doing dynamic stretching, you're using your movement and your body weight to help stretch out the muscle. I know, I apologize for that connection. I'm in my garage right now, so I can actually demonstrate. And the connection here is not quite as strong, but stay with me, guys, stay with me. When you do the replay, it plays smoothly, okay? Um, so we're gonna be doing a couple of each. I told you I had four favorite ways of stretching out your hip flexors. I wish I could have made it like a more tidy number, like three or five, but there's four basic ways um, that I like to do hip flexor stretching. And I'm gonna show you how to do it for below the knee, above the knee, with prosthesis, without prosthesis, and also for my bilaterals. I'm gonna show them some love. All right, so the first one, guys, is the most obvious one, the one that you all are probably most familiar with, and it's basically lying on your belly, okay? So I'm gonna show you why this works. All right, can y'all see me? Okay, so for many of my patients, if they're able to tolerate being on their belly for any length of time, even if it's just for five or 10 minutes, this is a great way to get an even stretch on both hip flexors, okay? And for the most part, just lying flat like this is enough for many of my patients to already start feeling a stretch. 
Now, if they're lying like this and they're not feeling a stretch, the next thing is to go up onto their elbows. The nice bonus about this is that you're also stretching out the abdominal muscles as well, giving them a nice little gentle stretch. And it's holding the stretch, okay? And then if you're a real hot shot, you can go up onto your arms like this, okay? A lot of my folks who practice yoga end up opting for that particular stretch. Now, with that stretch, like I said, the reason why I like it, guys, is it's the same for bilaterals as it is for above the knee, as it is for below the knee, okay? So you can put yourself on your belly and start with your head down the way you saw me originally, prop up onto your elbows, and then as you slowly stretch things out, then you can prop up onto your hands for that extra stretch. Things to watch out for. There should be no pain, guys. Stretching should not be painful. This is a very old, old myth, okay? It's not a no pain, no gain situation. Stretching should be exactly that, a stretch, and it should be gentle. If you start cranking on your tendons and your ligaments and stretching them out too much, you're going to run into injury, not to mention it's very uncomfortable. Second thing about stretching, guys, it takes time. Okay. The same way that in order to see gains on your muscle strength, it can take weeks and months of training consistently. When it comes to stretching, it takes time to stretch out. All right. So one more thing I'm going to add to the prone position. If you're able to tolerate being prone, being on your belly like that. Okay. For my above the knee patients, you can put a towel roll. And of course I am missing all of my equipment today, but that's okay. We're going to make it work here. Towel. For my husband's old garage towels. Okay. So as an above the knee, if you're lying here, you can take the towel, place it under the residual limb just to give it a little bit of an extra lift. Okay. So it's actually stretching from here and you're stretching this way. Does that make sense guys? All right, so that is an example of a static stretch, okay? And Virginia, I'm going to get to that right now. So Virginia says, I can't lay on my stomach. I'm a dialysis patient. And honestly, Virginia, a lot of my patients cannot tolerate lying on their stomach. Many of them, they're just uncomfortable. They have back pain. They might carry a lot of their weight in their belly. So being on their stomach just really makes it uncomfortable. Neck pain. Guys, I get it, but this is the first most basic one. Here's another one. And this is also a considered to be a static stretch. This one happens to be a favorite one with my patients because I usually include a hot pack treatment and it just feels good. So this one, you're gonna lie on your back. Your residual limb is on the outside, okay? So what you're going to do is you scoot your butt all the way to the edge of the table or the bed. Please do not fall off your bed doing this exercise, guys, okay? Be safe while you're doing this. You're going to lie down, and you're going to bring your sound limb and put it flat on the mat like this. You take your residual limb, and you slowly drop it off the table. Now guys, I like to do this one with the prosthesis on because it just adds more weight. I'm feeling the stretch already on my own. It adds more weight to your leg. So it allows for gravity to stretch it out even further like this. This is how you would do this exercise for above the knee and below the knee amputees, the exact same way. If you are a bilateral amputee, then the way you would do this exercise is with your leg that's still on the table, just prop it up just a little bit. This basically takes the stress off of your back, okay? And if you're a bilateral, you obviously scoot to one side, let it relax down, and then scoot to the other side and do the other leg, okay? And usually if I'm using a warm pack or a hot pack, again, be careful with your skin, I just lay it right here on the front part of the hip and it just helps the person relax a little bit more into the stretch. It feels really weird talking upside down like that, guys. <laughs> so funny. Okay, so that is another example of a static stretch. I like to call that the sofa stretch. And that's what I tell my patients. When you're on the sofa watching TV, put yourself in a position 
where you can scoot to the edge of the sofa safely without falling off, right? And you're just slowly letting that leg rest down and letting gravity pull it down, okay? And again, keeping your other leg bent up like the way you saw me do it so you can take the stress off your lower back. If you're feeling pain in your back, that means you have to adjust your positioning, okay? Or it could be that you're being too aggressive with your stretch, okay? That psoas muscle, that iliopsoas muscle that I was telling you about that is right here, it has connections to a lot of things in this area. It even has connections to your lumbar spine, your lower back. So that's why if you have a really tight hip flexor and you're too aggressive with stretching it out, you're going to hurt your back, okay? Because it's attached to your back. So you're pulling on your back when you're pulling on that muscle. Is that making sense, guys? I used to be a little bit more aggressive in my younger years as a PT and stretching this muscle out for my patients. But I realized if I just gave my patient more time and we just took the stretching slowly and used their body weight to do the stretching, it was a lot more effective in the long run and it prevented issues like low back pain from coming up. Does that make sense, guys? I'm not hearing too much in the comment section. Y'all got to show me some love in the comment section. Let me know you're listening. Two thumbs up. This is making sense, Kosi. Anything. Put it out in there for me. All right. So these two exercises I just showed you, these two stretching, I shouldn't call them exercises, these two stretching movements I just showed you, they are considered to be static. Okay. It's basically put the leg in a position and let the stretch happen. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Stephen. Y'all are listening. Y'all get a gold star today. These next two exercises are going to be considered dynamic exercises. And those of you who are still listening right now, this is the key to getting your hip flexors loose. In doing these two particular exercises I'm going to show you now, I've had people resolve their hip flexion contractures and tightness, meaning we got rid of it. And those of you who are using flexion plate, hip flexion plate, if that kind of sounds familiar, that's a special kind of metal plate that they put on an above the knee amputee when they have too much of a hip flexion contracture. When my patients do these next two exercises, nine times out of 10, we're able to get rid of that hip flexion plate. That's how good these exercises are. Do I have your attention now? Yes? Okay, good. So, can't, oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm just trying to... Jean's there, yes, thank you, Jean. Patricia, awesome. Krista, yes, thank you guys for the comments. Virginia, I can't wait for you to try this as well. And guys, these, oh, Linda, you are so sweet. We've got Andy, Pastor David, all good. Thank you guys for the feedback. I love interacting with you guys. I hate just talking to a screen. I would much rather be interacting with people, so that's why I'm always poking at you to answer me. Um, so guys, when it comes to doing this exercise, Mark asked a good question. How long do you lay on your belly? Here's the thing. If you're doing your stretch correctly, you could hold it for a really long time, okay? If you're holding your stretch to the point where you feel a slight stretch, but it's not painful, you'll be able to hold it for a longer period of time. And when you do that, it's kind of like that sweet spot. When you hit that sweet spot where you're feeling that stretch, it feels good, doesn't feel painful, over a couple of minutes, you're going to start to notice that your body relaxes into that stretch. Okay. For me, guys, I suffer from seriously tight hamstrings, right? I'm constantly having to work on my hamstrings. When I'm not patient with myself and I try to rush that stretch too much, I can only tolerate like 10 or 15 seconds of the stretch. Okay. But if I'm doing my stretches correctly on my hamstrings, for example, I can sit there for a good 10 minutes and it's just very gradual. So usually I tell patients, position yourself to feel the stretch. So if you're lying on your belly, feel the stretch and just hold it and breathe. If you're not able to breathe comfortably, that means you're being too aggressive and you need to back off just a little bit. So when you find that good spot, you're going to feel that stretch. And then all of a sudden you're going to feel almost like a release. Okay. It's that muscle. It's that tendon just slowly releasing. And then you hold it there in that release. And then if you can, you stretch a tiny, tiny bit more. It's a very slow process, but it's very effective when you do it correctly. All right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of stretching after we're finished with these two exercises as well. Because I know I've never really 
gone into that too much um, on the show because I haven't been able to demonstrate. Hey, Steven, so glad you could join in. Okay, guys, so this next one, it's considered to be a dynamic stretch. Why? Because our bodies are moving and this exercise might look familiar because we did it last week, okay? So guys, if you didn't see last Wednesday's Strong Body Show, I did a whole show on the magic of the bridging exercise, right? How to do bridges to strengthen your glutes and strengthen your core. What I didn't tell you last week is the bonus is when you do your bridges, you're also stretching out your hip flexor muscles. So I'm gonna show you right now how to do it. It's a three in one package. And guys, if you didn't see the bridging um, exercise last week, it's up on my Facebook and YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch those as well. Hey, Jose Luis de las Islas Canarias. Anda, chio, bienvenido, bienvenido. All right, so for this next one, it's the bridging, okay? For those of you who are comfortable using your prosthesis, you can leave your prosthesis on. If you are not comfortable using your prosthesis, okay, we're gonna pretend that I am an above the knee amputee on my right side, okay? So what I have here, guys, it's a foam roller. You can use a foam roller, you can use a step, a small step stool, okay? And you can rest your residual limb on here. We did this exercise last week with my two amputee models, okay? So that's a way to modify it. <clears throat> but for those of you who are using your prosthesis while you're doing this exercise, right? You're gonna position both of your feet as flat as you can. Those of you with your prosthetic foot, it's not gonna go flat. It might stick up like that and that's okay. You're gonna make sure that your knees are lined up, okay? You're gonna squeeze your butt together and then you're gonna lift up off the surface, okay? So you can see I've lifted my butt up off the surface and right here, I'm actually extending my hip. So I'm feeling, I'm already feeling the stretch. I'm feeling a stretch on the front of my hip and then bringing it slowly back down, okay? So once again, feet on the mat, make sure your knees are even. You're gonna squeeze your butt together, lift your butt up off the mat, right? And really lift it as high as you can go. And you're stretching out that front part of your hip. You hold it for the count of five, and then you slowly bring it back down. We'll do it one more time. Squeeze your butt up in the air, hold it so you feel the stretch in the front of your hips, and then slowly bring it back down. If you are not using your prosthesis, you get your foam roller. Hopefully you guys can see that. It's just a basic foam roller. Or you can get your step stool, which it looks like my kids ran off with it. Go figure. You put it underneath your residual limb. And the same thing. Your other leg stays on the mat, okay? You're gonna squeeze your butt together and you're gonna lift up off the mat, okay? Same concept. You're using your residual limb to push down on the foam roller to lift your butt up off the mat, okay? And then coming back down again. For my folks who are bilateral amputees, you're gonna take the same foam roller and you're just gonna put it underneath both of your residual limbs, okay? So we're gonna pretend I'm a bilateral above the knee amputee. It's gonna go tucked really close to my bottom, right? Underneath my residual limbs where it's comfortable. I'm gonna squeeze my butt and I'm gonna lift up in the air, okay? So it's giving my front a nice stretch as well, all right? So let me see if I can read these comments that just came in. <laughs> okay. So I know some of these comments came in. I can't read it from all the way over there. Okay. So Krista says, I hope this will help. My problem is I have wheelchair groin where I can't lay straight. Been almost five years. So Krista, I have had more than one person call me or not call me, email me saying the same thing that they've been in a wheelchair, they've been sedentary for several years since their amputation, right? And they're looking to get more active, but they know that they are super tight. I'm not gonna lie to you, after five years, those hip flexors are probably contracted. They're not gonna be just tight, there's gonna be a contracture there, meaning that the tendon has undergone changes and it's now that new shortened length, okay? It doesn't mean there's no hope, it just means you have to proceed with caution. 
Okay. Remember what I said earlier, Krista, the iliopsoas muscle, that tendon, right? It's attached to several parts of your bones in your hip and, and lower back area. So if you get too aggressive with stretching, you can cause some damage to the bone structures within, including your lower back. So what's a girl to do? You need to go see the physical therapist. Why? Because they can really put their hands on you and just see how tight that muscle is. This is for a general stretching routine, okay? And those of you who have mild to moderate tightness, those of you who have been wheelchair bound, okay, again, you need to have someone put their hands on your hip and really kind of dig in there. For my patients who are in this case scenario, I will take my fingers and I will palpate deep into their hip to find that iliopsoas muscle. And I can feel it. And there's some techniques that we use as physical therapists to help start releasing that muscle. Okay. But that's something that needs a lot more TLC than a person who has mild to moderate tightness. But Krista, like I said, it's something that can be worked on. You just got to do it the right way. Okay. And guys, I'm showing you four ways of, of stretching out your hip flexors. There's a whole lot more out there, but these are the four basic ones that I can apply to most of my patients and most of my viewers and even most of my runners. Okay. So that's why I'm picking out these four. All right. Who we got? Who we got? We got Julie from Northern Ireland. Julie, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Glenn. That's so sweet. Thank you. All right. Who else we got? We got Makes sense, Krista. And again, guys, when it comes to finding and working with the physical therapist, it doesn't necessarily have to be an amputee specialist. Obviously that's the ideal, but let's face it, there's not a whole lot of us around, but any physical therapist with a license in their hand knows the principles of stretching and understands the, the physiology and the anatomy behind it. Okay. And yeah, I'm kind of going to plug my book here, but if you give a physical therapist, one of my books, who's never worked with an amputee before, they're going to be able to open it and say, Oh, okay, this is how we do it. And they can move on from there. All right. Marianne is here. Marianne. Wonderful. Cause I'm where I'm, I'm giving out tidbits for bilateral amputees as well, Marianne. So I'm so glad you're here. All right. So guys, I did the two static, right? Lying on your belly, lying on your back, static stretches. I just demonstrated for you the bridging exercise and how that is considered to be a dynamic stretch. You're using your muscle contractions. You're using movement, right? To get that stretch going. I'm going to show you the fourth dynamic stretch. And this one's a real good one. This is a good one. It's one of my favorites. Let me make sure I can, you guys can see my feet in the picture for this one. Okay. So a lot of times when I'm working with my patients, I will be doing balance work. And one of the balance exercises is walking in a tandem line. Some people like to call it the DUI walk. That's how they remember. It's easy to remember. So basically you take one foot and you put it directly in front of the other. This is considered to be a higher level balance exercise, guys. Usually you need to do this exercise either in the parallel bars or with a countertop for support. I'm actually cheating a little bit and using this table right here for support right now. So you're putting one foot directly in front of the other. Now, how in the world is that stretching out your hip flexors? Take a note when I'm doing this exercise, all right? So if I stand back here, guys, this pay attention to this hip on the outside and look at what my hand is doing. Coming forward, not a big deal. But as I'm transferring my weight and I'm bringing my other foot forward and I'm leaning forward, do you see how much extension I'm getting on this front part of my hip? Okay, so let me just show you. I'm going from here to here. Now I'm exaggerating it a little bit by leaning back to show you, but it really doesn't take a whole lot to start feeling that stretch, especially on some of my patients who are feeling tight to begin with. Now the key to this is doing this exercise properly. You have to do it slowly. And in some cases you have to have two hands for support. So you use a kitchen counter on one side and the kitchen island on the other side. Okay. So let's go ahead and try that again, just so you guys can see it. It's a slow and deliberate movement. It's just one foot directly in front of the other. And if we're using this leg as the reference leg, okay, you can see when I'm pushing off, right? I'm starting to get a stretch in the front of that hip. And then I just keep moving forward. Now, it doesn't end there, guys, okay? For those of you who are progressing with this exercise, 
Now we take it back. So look at what happens when I go backwards. I'm bringing this leg. Look how far back I have to extend, guys, to get it behind me. Look at that stretch I'm getting right there, right? And then I come back and I bring the other leg, right? And then if I'm bringing the tight leg back again, look how far back I have to reach. And look how I'm also keeping my torso straight. I'm not doing this, right? Because that's cheating. And I'm also going to hurt my back doing that. I'm simply moving the hip back and walking backwards. Okay? So I'm going to try it one more time. You can either go forward, right? Forward one foot in front of the other. And as you're moving forward, you start to get that gentle stretch in the front of the hip. Okay? Or we can take it backwards, right? We can move the hip back, give it a gentle stretch, keeping our torso nice and tidy, right? And then bringing it back. And again, I'm stretching both legs at the same time. I'm using this outer leg as a reference, okay? But you're actually stretching out both legs right here in the front of the hip, okay? I'll tell you what, guys, I can't wait for my models to come back because it's so much easier to explain when they're doing the work, <laughs> okay? So here, there's some questions that came on board. Uh, Virginia, I would love to know. Actually, Virginia, what would you like to learn about? Uh, there's so many exercises, Virginia. There's like, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. There's over 150 exercises on my online exercise program. So I need you to tell me what is it that you want to learn about? And I will feature that next week, Virginia. I'm going to put it on you today, Virginia. You get to pick. Patricia asks, do you do this if you're using forearm crutches? Yes, Patricia. Obviously, the number one thing you have to be careful with is safety, right? You have to create a safe environment for yourself, okay? So when you're doing this exercise, Patricia, you got to kind of figure it out. Remember how I said last week, guys, when you're first doing these exercises, they're not going to be perfect. They're not even going to be pretty because you got to figure out how to modify these exercises for your situation, whether you're using a cane, a walker, crutches, whether you're in a home, okay, that has space to work in, okay? So for this exercise, Patricia, especially if you need bilateral support, meaning something in both hands, I would say go find your kitchen counter, right? Kitchen counter is nice and sturdy. Some of you are lucky that you have a kitchen counter and a kitchen island, so you can get sandwiched right in between the two and use those for support, okay? Other people, and this happened to my patient two weeks ago, she has a very narrow hallway in her home. It's so narrow that she can basically brace herself on both walls for support with her arms, okay? So that's a nice option for her to use, right? Um, another option is if you only have one kitchen countertop, Patricia, then you would put your weaker, the side that needs the most support with the countertop and then use your forearm crutch on the other side, okay? And then always put a chair behind you, put a chair somewhere, have a caregiver or a loved one nearby in case you need them to put that chair near you, okay? And the thing is, this exercise is a slow exercise. I'm not moving at 100 miles an hour. So it's something that you can control and keep yourself safe. Have I hammered that one in enough? Okay. And guys, when you're first starting this exercise, because a lot of people are like, I can't put one foot in front of the other. It's too, like, right? I get it. So I'll just tell my patients, do the best you can, okay? So if you're walking backwards and you can't go directly behind like this, just start walking backwards. Just start that movement, okay? Just start with that. And as you bring your leg back, you're going to feel a little bit of stretch right here, okay? And guys, if you're not at that level yet, that's okay. That's why I gave you three other exercises on how to stretch your hip flexors at the comfort of a mat, your sofa, or your bed. Does that make sense, guys? All right. Let me see. V-O-H. Carol, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Um, Pastor David says, I've tried this, but my socket diameter is large and make it difficult to put my feet heel to toe. This is a tough one. And yes, David, you're not the only one. There are some folks that the, the, because they're in above the knee and the socket is really high up. It's hard to kind of do that exercise. So David, for you, 
that's how you modify it. We're going to show you how to modify it. Okay. So if your socket is really cumbersome in the upper area, then just put your feet apart just a little bit, David. So you can just put your feet apart like this and just walk backwards. Boom. Boom. Okay. You're still getting a stretch. You're still getting a stretch. The key with this is making sure that your torso is not doing anything funky, that you're not going like this, right? As you're going back, right? Or you're not doing this or anything weird like that, that you're keeping your torso as straight as possible. And so that the movement is coming from your hip itself. Does that make sense, David? And believe me, I had patients. It's not too often that I get a patient that on the first try, they can put that foot directly one behind the other. It's not a whole lot of patients that can do that. It's something that we work towards doing. Does that make sense? And remember about the stretching. You put your body in the position until you feel that stretch. So if you're feeling a stretch, congrats, you're doing something right. Okay, make sense? All right, Virginia says, I've been going to outpatient PT and they never shown this exercise. And again, Virginia, there's so many different ways to stretch out the hip flexors. These are the particular exercises that I find work the best. And I'll be honest with you guys, that one where you're walking backwards, I'll tell you a story. This happened to me, I think it was right when I opened up my own clinic. A patient came in and he had a significant hip flexure contracture to the point where the prosthetist had to put a hip flexion plate into his socket. And when I was testing and working with him, it was so tight that if I went in there and cranked on it, I knew I was going to cause damage because it was just so tight um, and discomfort. So I was like, okay, we can't use those manual techniques that I sometimes use. So I just said, okay, let's just, let's just start working with you in the parallel bars and let's just see what we can do to work around this hip flexion contracture. I had him doing the forward and backward tandem guys. I kid you not within six months he was out of that hip flexion plate. And it was one of those things where it, 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 I felt like a dummy because I was just like, how did I not see this? Light bulb went off on my head because he came one day for his appointment. And he's like, they took the hip flexion plate out because the hip flexion contracture is practically gone. It wasn't completely gone, but it was practically gone. And I'm just like, what have we been doing with therapy? Because we haven't been able to do some of these stretching exercises. And, and it finally dawned on me. And I'm like, just going up and down doing tandem because I'm really picky if in case you haven't noticed, I'm really picky with my patients about doing good form. So if you're doing good form, doing these exercises, right? Torso, making sure you, you move at the hip, you're going to get that stretch in there, right? All right, guys, let's see what else is coming down the pike here. Okay. Julie, excellent question. She asked, would you put your amp side to the worktop side. Okay, guys, this is one where there's the textbook answer and then I'm gonna tell you the, the what I really do with my patients. The textbook answer would say, put your amputee side on the outside and put the kitchen countertop on your opposite. So if you are a left-sided amputee, right? If you're a left-sided amputee, then you're gonna stand with your right side to the countertop. Right. And that's going to give you the most support as you're doing the exercise. OK, that's technically the way you should be doing it. That being said, if you find that you feel you are more safe doing it the other way, then do it the other way. OK, and the important thing is to be safe while you're doing this exercise. And then number two is the form. Yeah. All right. Steven, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'll tell you what, I had some really good mentors that taught me how to do this. So can't do it without them. Okay. Uh, Krista asks, good question, Krista. Can you do these stretches laying on the bed or do you need a harder surface? Um, either way, Krista, I worked home health for eight years. And I tell you what, I don't think I walked into a single home that had one of these tables on. <laughs> so I had to get creative. Um, I would see the sofa. Usually for many people, the sofa is just a little too narrow or a little too soft. The exception being that one where you're lying on your back and you let the leg drop. That's a fantastic sofa stretch. So most of the time I would do it on, uh, help the patient position themselves on their bed and do it that way. Um, so that's how we usually do those stretches. But yes, it can totally be done. And again, guys, get creative, safe, be safe, 
but be creative, you know, modify your home environment, do what you got to do to make yourself be able to do some of these exercises. All of these, I mean, guys, you can see my incredibly messy garage, right? I got four kids, so that's my excuse. I have four kids. I have a messy garage, clean home, messy garage. Guys, this is where I do all of my own workouts. I don't have a gym membership. I do all my workouts out of the garage as well, okay? And you just got to figure out a way to modify things and make it work. Here's the last thing I'm going to be talking to you guys about. And this is a COSI poll, so I want to see questions in the answer session, in the, in the answer section. When should you do your stretches? Should you do them before you exercise or after you exercise? I'm going to give you all a minute. I want to see what you guys think about that. Jean says, I use my coffee table. There you go. Oh, that's a good one, Jean. Actually, you're right. I have a coffee table. It's a pretty big one myself. And it's something I can position myself on. All right, guys, I'm going to sit here and wait. I want to hear. I want to hear from my Irish folks. I want to hear from my American folks. I want to hear from my, my gentleman from the Canary Islands. Pastor David, you laughing at me. All right. So Patricia says before. Krista says both. Jean says after. Uh, Steven says after. Glenn says before and after. Covering all your bases there, Glenn. I see what you're doing. Steven says before. All right. So here's the thing, guys. There have been Pastor says, I like to do them before. Angela says beforehand and both. Uh, Glenda says before. Marianne says, I'd say both. That's what I do. So guys, there have been papers. There have been blogs. There have been forums. There have been wars lost based on the argument of when do you do stretching? Okay. Here's what I like to do. Okay. When it comes to stretching, remember how I talked about you have to go slow, you have to be gentle, you got to be nice to your ligaments and your tendons while you're stretching, right? The unfortunate thing is, compared to your muscle, the actual red juicy muscle, your tendons do not get as much circulation, okay? They don't have as much circulation. That's kind of what helps contribute a part to their tightness, right? So if your circulation is just resting circulation, like what you are just kind of sitting there and your body's not warm, you're going to be stretching on cold tendons. Okay. And guys, I was a child of the eighties and nineties where those coaches made you do stretches like gangbusters before you even took a step out onto the track and field. Right. So think about it, guys. You don't have as much circulation going to those tendons, and now you're going to start stretching them. It's like taking a dried out rubber band and starting to try to stretch. What's going to happen? Right? Versus, you know, you got that rubber band that's kind of old, and you just kind of massage it a little bit. You put some of your, you know, the oils from your skin on that rubber band, and you kind of get it loosened up a little bit, and then you can stretch it out more. Okay. So what happens to my folks who are not ambulatory? How do they get warmed up in order to be able to do some of these stretching exercises? Movement, guys, movement, okay? And I'm guilty myself of not doing warm-ups enough, but for my patients, I have them do warm-ups, okay? Warm-up can be something as simple as walking up and down the parallel bars. A warm-up can be as simple as doing the hand bike, or even if you're at home, just doing this motion, for five minutes straight, guys, seriously, do this motion for five minutes straight, you're gonna start to have <laughs> your heart rate go up and you're gonna break a sweat, okay? So that's what I do with my patients. I have them do some general movement to get their heart rate up. And how do I know when my patients are ready? Typically, because they say, you know what? I gotta take off my jacket, it's getting a little warm in here. Boom, now I know they're ready, okay? When you start to kind of break out a little bit of a sweat, when your heart rate goes up a little bit, that's when you're ready. And that's when it's optimal to do the stretch. Why? Because your blood vessels have started dilating. They started opening up. So there's more circulation going to your extremities. There's more circulation going to those tendons. So those tendons are getting a lot more juicy and pliable. Yeah? So for me, guys, for my stretching, I do a warm-up but I do my stretching after my runs. <laughs> Pastor David says, Lord, I repent. Oh my goodness. And guys, like I told you, there have been wars fought on this topic, right? 
There are clinicians who will staunchly say, no, you should do it before because you've got to prepare the muscle and the, the ability to run. This is just how I do it, guys. Okay. To me, this is where I get the most results from my patients and I get the least injuries by doing it after they're nice and warmed up. Okay. And even the one where you're going back and forward, I don't start my patients on that exercise. I'll start them walking up and down the parallel bars doing something else so that when we get to that tandem exercise, they're already kind of warmed up. Here come the comments. Let's see. So Glenn says, so at practice for football, we have the players jog a half lap before stretching. That's enough to warm them up. Yes. Yes. And honestly, Glenn, for me, like I said, I'm a runner and I'm looking at my neighborhood. It takes me a block to walk out of my neighborhood. That's my warm up. How do I know I'm warmed up? Because I'm starting to feel a little bit, you know, hot under the collar. It's starting. I feel the need to take off a sweater. That's how I know I'm warmed up enough. And even when I do my running, because I know I have some runners out there listening. When I do my running, I started a super, super slow jog, which is tough because a lot of people like that when they go running with me, they like to take off and I'm holding them back. Okay. So then when I get home, my muscles feel like so nice and loose and guys, I got some tight hamstrings. So, but it feels so much easier to stretch them out at that point, a gentle stretch, right? So yes, Glenn, absolutely. If your players are feeling a little bit warm now, granted with young people, they, they need a little bit more. So they might, you know, just breaking out that light sweat a little bit out of breath their skin starts to feel warmer. That's how you know that circulation is going through there. Okay. Marianne says, I do push-ups and sit-ups before I get off my bed. Holy cow, Marianne, you're my hero. You're my hero. Mark says, juicy and pliable. How nice. I know. I like using those words, Mark. It gets the point across, right? You got that mental image in your head now. You're welcome. All right. Krista says, that makes common sense. I was thinking that stretching was a warm-up. And guys, like I said, I grew up, my PE coaches who were great coaches, you know, you do your stretches before you go running, you limber up, right? They would tell you limber up before you go running, before you do the exercise. And it's like, no, you have to warm up. Yes. But the actual act of stretching out those muscles, especially if you have a tightness that you know about, eh, I'd leave it for afterwards. I'd leave it for afterwards. And then finally, the next common question I get is how long does it take? <laughs> And again, there is no magic number, but just to give you an idea that it does take a long time, guys, for me, I haven't done stretching my hamstrings in a long time. I've been bad. So I'm basically starting at square one with my stretching routine for my hamstrings. It's going to take me two to three months to get the flexibility back. Okay. It takes a long time. And that's me stretching if not every day, every other day after my daily run, okay? It's kind of the tedious, and those of you who bought my book, you can read that section I wrote on flexibility. I am the worst person with flexibility. I will be the first to admit it. I never have time to do stretching. But here's the thing, guys. If you don't take the time to do those 10 minutes of stretching, of paying attention to the body parts that are tight, and it's not just hip flexors. We'll cover some more stuff later on down the line you're going to run into injuries later on. And then you're going to have to take the time to rehab those, right? Virginia, darling, you didn't get back to me. What do you guys want to hear about next week? Let's start putting some comments in there. What, what kind of exercises, stretching, strengthening, balance, you name it, I'm going to have it in that program. So what would you guys like to hear about next week? Jeopardy theme song. Da, 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 da. And I'm sitting here looking at the comment section. Who's going to comment for me? Anybody? Y'all still there? No, Virginia, if you did, I didn't see it. What would you like to hear about, Virginia? I know I'm picking on you guys now. Okay, Stephen says something on balance. Anybody else? Glenda says balance. Okay, I'm seeing a pattern. Improving single leg stance. Oh, Glenn, he's getting fancy with the specifics here. Uh, Rupert says balance. Jean says old question, muscle building in the residual limb. Okay. And Marianne says balance because I am at the bottom. So 
balance has it. All right, guys, next week on Wednesday, I will bring you an exercise on balance that you can do as a beginner. So Marianne says she's on the bottom of the totem pole for that as a beginner and my other lovely lady here who's post off up through advanced. And hopefully next week I'll have my models back here with me. So you'll have something more interesting to look at than me doing these exercises. Um, guys, tonight, ooh, I like that, Linda. Lately I've been moving in place to music. I love to dance. Oh, we might just have to put that in there, Linda. You gave me a great idea. I love dancing, guys. I used to dance all the time, semi-professionally. So we're gonna have to, yeah. We're going to have to think of something there. All right, guys, tonight there is a show, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is my more traditional Cozy Talk show. Um, so any questions that you guys have, you guys might come up with some questions between now and tonight about what we talked about today and this morning, okay? Guys, go out to my website. Check it out. It's priced what I think could be very reasonably. Those of you who are looking for ideas for Christmas presents, Okay. There you can go. You can either purchase the annual subscription, have access to the videos. You can either purchase the book, which is a beautiful book. I, I, I'm really proud of that book. Or you can purchase both. I've had a lot of you do that because it's a great way to be watching the videos and reading the book exercises at the same time. Uh, Virginia asked, do we need anything for balance for next week? No, Virginia, you just need to bring your lovely self because I will have everything here set up and ready to go. And as you can see, guys, I don't use a lot of bells and whistles with equipment because I like to keep things simple. So no, Virginia, you just got to show up. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off for now. I hope to see you all tonight. Put your alarms on your on your phone. So 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight, I will be seeing you. Bring me any questions that you may have had from this morning, okay? And that's all I've got, folks. God bless. Bye.